this measurement technique. Uh, and uh, okay, please ask uh, questions. Okay, uh, if you have some specific interest in some specific type of uh, using this measurement for your flow, also ask me questions. Maybe I will have some comments which are which are useful uh, for your case, because uh, it's already been applied to very broad uh, range of problems, and. Uh, uh, Christoph is here, and uh, recently we presented this work also that uh, Ron did in uh, what is called resuspension. So this method is very useful, much more useful than other methods. <coughs> Near the boundaries, as we said, our floors are not living without boundaries. So near the boundaries, just because it's very uh, easy to follow a particle near a boundary, Okay, uh, and if you manage to uh, mask it somehow optically, then your Lagrangian trajectory will be even better description near the boundary than making grids and trying to bring some uh, flow field uh, uh, displacements because displacement here is very small. And if you try to measure otherwise, it will be uh, difficult to measure small uh, velocity vectors. So, uh, even in the ocean, uh, this kind of method was uh, applied. Uh, one of the uh, things that we um, want to say that you can also track different things and apply this particle tracking not only to particles but also to biological matter. It also works very well, especially if you have some shapes and you want to measure some anisotropic particles, you don't have to work only with spherical particles that you make yourself. Uh, show you some. How many particles you can track. And this is an experiment like uh, six years ago. These are heavy particles coming to the bottom, similar to what we saw in this rotating uh, uh, dense particle suspension, of course. It's not as dense, so it's still optically accessible. Actually, in this system, it is optically accessible from two sides, and I will show you some things. What you might not see because of the quality of this image, uh, of this video, especially in this uh, presentation, but you can find this video on YouTube. Uh, um, there are two types of particles. There are large particles that mimic a second phase, a solid phase, and there are very tiny uh, flow tracers that mimic the flow, and you can actually do measurements in what is called two-phase turbulent flow, of course, and the limit were optically accessible. Uh, here is another example of what we call resuspension or working near the boundary. So we have a boundaries, we have these particles, we have some kind of vertical flow that suspends them or pulls them out into turbulence. Okay, these are obviously dense particles, okay, so they are not neutrally buoyant. They are returning to the uh, back, and you can see the flow is strongly three-dimensional, and what you want to measure, even in this kind of flow, it's a strong uh, uh, three-dimensional flow. What you also want to measure, it's, you see here also tiny particles, and you can measure flow around this event and understand what are the forces, or what are the leading vortex uh, <laughs> that causes resuspension of particle matter. So, as we said, what we want to obtain is this very convoluted line. This line is what we can uh, draw only afterwards when we know what it did. Uh, the particle started here. It got a label A at, at arbitrary time T0. And for this particle, it's an absolutely arbitrary time. Okay, you could start here, if you could catch it here, you would mark it A here and follow the same path, or, yeah, for this particle. And what you actually measure is this vector, which is a vector which is property of two things, A and T, and this is a three-dimensional vector in space. If you take at any moment a position, okay, which is this vector after a long time measured from the uh, original position, 
and you derive it, so you take a derivative in time, you get a vector v of this particle a in t, right? So what we are, I would like to uh, uh, be clear about what we measure is this one. It's called v just to be different from what we write here as u. And u, as you said, it's Eulerian or any flow field uh, described in any kind of framework. So we know that at this moment of time, in this position, if I would measure a velocity vector by another sensor or by uh, some other means, I would measure velocity vector identical to the velocity vector that is attached to the particle A, right? So from uh, U at the position of this particle at time T, this particle at time T, at this position, a velocity at this time is exactly equal to the velocity of the particle labeled eight at this time t. Okay? If this connection is clear, this to be said that this is the only known connection from the first principles between the Eulerian description and Lagrangian description. All other things are obtained only in statistical sense. So if I want to create structure function between this point and this point, it will be structure function in terms of v. And my conversion between v and u will be only through this identity. OK? So here is the identity sign saying that this is the equivalence. So what we uh, later can obtain as a solution for turbulent flow fields will be through this identity. And later, if you mark different particles and give them different names or color them by different colors, then you can get multiple trajectories. Uh, here, schematically, every dot is a measurement point. Of course, distance between the dots is not known to us. It's accepted only after we measure the velocity of that particle. So we derived and measured velocity. And if there are two particles passing a small volume at the same time, and they are close enough, we can construct u at position at x and x plus r, and then we can get statistics even in the Eulerian sense, if we are lucky. OK, so how do you do 3D PTV? As we said, you need uh, image acquisition and you need a multi-camera arrangement. And I will explain why you need multi-camera and why do you need many cameras. Uh, later, once you acquired those videos from different directions, you will go through this particle detection that I already mentioned. And I will mention again in the context of what we can do in real time. But afterwards, every particle is identified in one of the images of one of the cameras, okay? So I will need to draw here some sketch of information flow. And this will be image one, two, and this will be time. And here we'll have cameras. So this will be camera one, camera two, and so on. In every image, we'll go through particle detection. So we will we will identify some objects in different cameras. After that, what we need to do to get three-dimensional information is what we call stereoscopic correspondence or matching. We do this matching to understand which one of the objects 
in, I, in uh, each one of the cameras is the same object that we see from different views, okay? How do we do this stereoscopic correspondence? There are, again, various methods. Uh, the most uh, practical or robust or useful method is the method based on what we call epipolar geometry. Epipolar geometry is uh, very schematically uh, described here. If we have a point in image one that is at an angle with another image that two cameras were at some stereoscopic view, like our eyes that are shifted in space and have some angle to the uh, space. And this particle uh, is in this pixel. If I send a straight line, the, what is called uh, imaging ray, between some uh, point origin of this camera and this particle, I will get a possible <coughs> set of points which mark in a line in the physical space that another camera will see as a line. And it's a straight line at the first approximation. If you have a single media and all the optics is for the moment assumed to be perfect. So along this line that is visible on this camera as a line, you can look for several optional partners to this particle. So if I take this particle, I will create this line in image two and this line in camera three. And this is at the same time, T0. Okay, now I have set of candidates that are not on the same line, but they're likely to be close enough to be a partner. The simple thing to do is to do iteration and repeat this analysis again and again for every one of the candidates in the opposite way, right? So we can send from here a line to here, take a candidate, send the line to another camera. We have already two lines because if we assume that this guy and this guy are the same guy from two views, then their partner should be in the intersection of two lines, okay? And we can repeat this iteratively and find the closest partner and do the stereo matching. So now I explained to you the process by three cameras, but you can do it in two cameras only if you have a low number of particles and very clear choice of the objects which are close to the line. So there is nothing preventing you to implement it just with two cameras. As long as our assumptions are correct, the imaging optics is perfect, the field of view is clear, all the particles are visible and so on and so on. And of course, you can probably uh, raise many hands and ask what if this doesn't work and this doesn't work, right? So two camera uh, solution is possible and uh, I will explain most of it in, in this framework, but uh, we will talk about practical things so I will explain you how to do it in practice with more than two cameras. So this step is called stereoscopic correspondence. And in the literature, if you look at uh, what is called 3D PTV setup, usually you will see a setup of three or four cameras. And for this setup, what you see, the process is like this. You mark a point, you get a line in the second camera. From each of the points in the second line, you get all lines. From this guy, you get its line. The intersection gives you a, a smaller number of choices. Then you move to the next camera, and then you can close the selection being uh, more uh, certain about the proper choice, okay? And of course, it's, you can do it cycli uh, in cyclic manner if you want to be even more sure. Uh, of course, every step like this, if you imagine a thousand of particles in the image, it's a lot of computational time, and you might want to save some time but doing it only once <coughs> and not in a long iteration manner. The next step is to move in the direction of time. So after the first step of imaging, 
we get objects and background. We did segmentation. These objects are in pixels of camera eye. After the second step of stereo matching, <coughs> we combine x pixels, y pixels, time, number of cameras into x, y, uh, x2 into, into x pixel i, y pixel i, j, when j is the number of matches. So obviously we lose some information. Not all the particles have partners in all the cameras. Some of them are visible just by one camera. Some of them are not certain and they will not proceed into the choice of matches. So now we have n cameras. I is the number of cameras in terms of pixels and every uh, one of those objects that got a uh, match got also a number which uh, labels it into the, in the image space, okay? It's still in pixels. And then we arrive, okay? And then we arrive in what is called particle tracking. So particle tracking you can do in one of the two ways. You can do particle tracking in two-dimensional space of pixels, as you do in 2D tracking, connecting pixel to pixel, pixel to pixel, and then arriving at <coughs> several objects, each one living in the pixel frame, in the, in the two-dimensional uh, framework of that image, and then <coughs> combining them into single three-dimensional vector in time. So you can go to complex geometrical objects in two-dimensional space and try to combine from them a complex geometrical object in the 3D space, okay? The time was recorded in the movie. A, a, another option, and this is the option that I suggest you to follow, is the option that I describe in the method, is to leave particles in the image frame not connected yet in time, now converting them into the three-dimensional objects of x, uh, j in time. So all those matches, we already know that they are corresponding with some certainty to the same object, and we can convert them into the particle in three-dimensional space. And then we can, from here, try to link them in time. Okay? So the one path, two-dimensional objects, two-dimensional connected objects in image space, three-dimensional objects in physical space, linking in time, or two-dimensional tracking in image space, and conversion of two-dimensional trajectories into this object. Uh, I don't know how, uh, how well you are uh, familiar with the three-dimensional geometrical transformations, but connecting these objects into three-dimensional trajectory, it's a very difficult task. Mainly because we don't know where this one started and whether it's a partner of this one in the different time or not. So we need to match in 3D space both time and space, whether in this method we already have some certainty about 3D positions of the particles, okay? And here the linking part is only connection of possible candidates in the three-dimensional space. But this tracking part, if I look at linking in this framework, working from three-dimensional space objects to link or from 2D, is basically the same method, so I can explain it on the board in, uh, in, the, in two dimensions, okay? Um, 
And I will just go to the slide where I increase this uh, uh, image uh, even more and uh, uh, show you the tracking uh, approach <coughs> there. What I can uh, tell you that this um, will bring you later something that we uh, used in turbulence and call it visualization to something that we actually can quantify the velocity along particle trajectories. Okay, so the colors here will be even uh, velocity acceleration or if you have enough particles uh, vorticity. Uh, the history of this method is very, very long. You should look something in uh, uh, before even uh, the digital cameras existed. Uh, I would uh, touch only, only a little bit the practical things like particles, but mainly if you have questions, I rather skip this and uh, focus on, uh, on uh, uh, the main things. Uh, basically, how do you choose any of these things in practice? It's, a, of course, experience and uh, a proper choice. One of the main things is, of course, a word uh, particle in tracking velocimetry or the word tracers. And you actually know that, well, clearly, what we measure is not the flow, right? We don't measure the air flowing or quantum fluid flowing or water. What we measure, we follow something which is a tracer, right? And tracer is, of course, an object that you choose, you add to the flow. Therefore, some say that all these tracking velocimetry methods or image velocimetry methods are not really non-intrusive. They are intrusive by adding another phase to it. But if you choose these tracers properly, you can claim that their path will follow closely the fluid path, and therefore we can apply and extract turbulent statistics. If you talk about all other uh, things, again, these are solved now, a uh, number of cameras, how to do calibration, I will show you a little bit about that, how to do detection and uh, 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 how to choose your elimination. But basically, as long as you have tracers and you see them in the image and you know the tracers follow truthfully your flow, you can go uh, and do experiments. So from very first experiment, this is experiment in uh, Rizzo, in uh, Denmark with the stroboscopes, the very first lasers that were used in uh, 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 gas lasers, argon ion, all kind of new devices like LEDs or light. The, the, the main advantage here is that you can provide light from many sources and you can actually uh, find the source which is suitable for your case. You don't have to focus it, therefore it doesn't have to be a laser, which is a big disadvantage in other methods. A number of cameras vary. Some did three, di three cameras, four cameras, uh, a single camera with some optical setup that mimics four cameras. Again, these are uh, details which are not uh, very important. Uh, particles, as you will notice at the first experiment you do with particle tracking, that the spherical ideal particles that we kind of imagine when we start developing algorithms do not look like this just because we look at the full field of view from different angles and every imaging optics will create you distortion of the particle image in the flow. So you need to remember it when you do uh, the particle tracking. The major disadvantage or major <coughs> problem for particle tracking is that it's a three-dimensional method and therefore you need to calibrate each one of your cameras such that you later can get your epipolar lines effectively. And it means that you need to do something like this. You need to create some object with a known, a large number of points known relative to each other in space, okay, positioned in some kind of complex three-dimensional grid. This Points should be visible from many angles, so you do some funny geometry such that cameras from different angles will see as many particles, as many dots as possible. And then you need to put it actually, locate it into your flow and take in images from all the cameras of this object, okay? 
So this is very uh, brutal way. And of course, if you do some uh, uh, experiments like wind tunnel, or if you do quantum turbulence measurements on, I don't know how to calibrate. Uh, but you need to think about a solution to this problem. Um, if you do it in air, it's simple. If you do it in corrosive liquid, it's not simple. And, uh, but this needs to be solved first before you can actually proceed to the three-dimensional objects. The problem is even more difficult when you have your cameras on <laughs> your side, on the laboratory side, and your flow is behind some glass wall or whatever, plexiglass wall or some other. What happens is that the picture of epipolar lines, as I was drawing before, assumed that two points along this line and all the points of this pixel will be along a straight line. But this is not true if you have change of index of refraction of your side, a glass or whatever boundary you have, and the fluid side, which can be, again, air like here or can be liquid and have different index of refraction. It means that now your imaging lines not anymore aligned with your basic imaging axis between the center of the uh, image and the particle uh, pixel position. And therefore, once you send a line, you get, <laughs> by Snell's law, you get, uh, uh, you get a different angle and then an another different angle. And if you project those, you project those on the line on the boundary, you project them on another line on the other side of the boundary, and then you connect them by straight lines. And of course here you will get not a straight line and not a simple line uh, because of uh, uh, additional complications which are just related to different media. So your path is nonlinear anymore, and the simple epipolar geometry is now uh, 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 more difficult. So to get a particle position in depth, you also need to solve some uh, stereo matching when your uh, lines are not parallel anymore. And this is additional difficulty, but, well, don't worry, the open PTV software has a solution for it. <laughs> <laughs> but if you are going to a more complex geometry, for instance, if this boundary will be curved, okay, I don't have a solution right now. So if this boundary will be a variable thickness, I don't have a solution right now, okay? So we'll, you will need some ad hoc adaptation of the algorithm to create some kind of a line here. There are works, right, from people sitting in here in the audience that suggest a different method of creating transformation from any line to image space, okay? You can go by uh, various methods, not exactly by optical solution like what I'm showing here. The concept is if you have a solution, of course, go and use it. You need to adapt calibration method to create what you need for the transformation, and then you invert your transformation and you get stereo matching. So basically, if you follow this kind of path, you need to do stereo matching. For stereo matching, you need three-dimensional calibration, if you don't want to use the existing, uh, or you cannot use the existing solution, you can work out some other solution. So practically what you will see also in the tutorial is kind of this set of lines, and then the choice of the most probable particle, it's still a choice, it's still statistics. It's still something choosing one of the possible partners, okay? So whatever we will do in this flow, as the number of particles increases, because we want to display, explain turbulent flows, we increase number of particles, we start paying the price of multiple choices. Some of them are certain only within a proper uh, boundary, or, uh, proper bound uncertainty bounds. And I will explain you what will happen next. So, for instance, we did stereo matching, and we inverted our calibration transformation, and we could take these four markers that were in the two-dimensional space pixels already marked as J. So all these lines are originated on the same partner and they give us by transformation a position in three-dimensional space. So we get 
uh, x, y, z in T in some uh, coordinate system. This coordinate system is defined only by your calibration. And now you need to find all partners in the next image and the image after that and so on and so on. So if you do only two frames, like in two-dimensional tracking and you have only two snapshots, the only choice you can do is basically the nearest neighbor. Okay, the only thing you can do is if your particles in image i in time t0 are close enough to position of images of presumably the same particles in the next image, then you can know the assignment or, or linking or tracking by assuming the nearest neighbor. So you say, this is my particle in image T0. This is a possible location in the time T1. And if there is a guy within the search radius, which is nearest, I can connect them. And I don't connect this one to this one just because these are closest. So this is nearest neighbor approach. I picture it here in space, but you can imagine it also in more uh, complicated uh, spaces. For instance, if you know the velocity before, you can also connect particles in the nearest neighbor of the velocity space. So you can also connect them in the nearest neighbor to the acceleration space. But one thing I believe you cannot break is what is called trackability parameter. The trackability parameter means that we want so many trajectories and these are particle real images from particle tracking software. So you can imagine that in 3D space, it's a very dense field. And of course, nearest neighbor is a very problematic thing. What you cannot break is the following. If these two particles are close together in the image i at time t0, and you will have these two close one again in the next image, you will never be able to choose who is who in this pair assignment, okay? So the trackability problem If I just, uh, again, what I picture schematically is in space, but you can think about it in the, in the phase. So you have these two particles in T0 and the T delta T, and after T plus delta T, then you have these two particles, and the possible choices are all valid. There are even more possible choices here, okay? The human mind always tries to link things even where they're not existing. For instance, you can believe me that these two were not in the flow before and just appeared in the next image, right? But I imaginary always like to connect things, so I, I already gave them a property of being in the flow before, right? So maybe these are not even Assigned. So not only the assignment between who is who, but even the choice if that appeared or disappeared again. So if your distance here between the particles is smaller uh, than the, the average velocity of the particles over time delta t, you will not be able to create trajectories. So what it means that the only way to solve this problem is to go delta t and push delta t to zero. As more particles you want to track, the only possible solution is to create high speed video where this particle will just go and appear in the following fashion. And of course this, as I said, works in 3D space. So what you can do, of course, is doing nearest space, a nearest neighbor search, not in one frame. If you have a video, you can do the following. You can choose a particle, find all the candidates, for instance, for this particle, all the candidates are within the search. These candidates in the next frame have their candidates. These candidates have their, their candidates. So you can have, build a four frame prediction and go four back frame backs correction. And you can do it 10 frames or 100 frames. 
and this will improve your situation, but at every step, you will still do this basic type of selection, okay? So if you want to measure something, this distance should be smaller than this distance between particles in time. So at present moment, I think the most effective, uh, computationally effective method is based on four, three, four frame uh, tracking methods. You can develop more sophisticated ones, but you will not be able to break everything. So, I said you can do it, right? But you need to work yourself in this complex phase space of all the problems, how to go from flow speed and adjust, and adjust camera recording rate, which is affected by trackability, which flow scales you want to remove will affect number of tracking, which will hit back the trackability, and so on and so on. So this is a very complex space when you want to start uh, doing experiments, but it is really worthy because at the end you can get some very complex uh, information about flow field and even some flow field information that you cannot get otherwise. For instance, a very long Lagrangian trajectory in uh, space. Now, you can do all kind of uh, uh, interesting solutions in optics. Mm -hmm. so by yes. Uh, if you, I will show you one experiment where you can, uh, I have a, a what is called lead-driven cavity, uh, lead-driven cavity uh, case, okay, which is a closed box with a shear at the top, and if you have a single particle in it, you have infinite time trajectory for that particle. You may lose it some portions of time, but then you can record it again and again and again and again. Eventually, you will have a complete description of the flow field. So if you have a recording capabilities and you have time, there is no problem. If you have, of course, problem of disappearing particle or, or particle leaving your field of view, then, of course, it's, it's uh, not possible. Um, uh, but there is a small bit that I want to add to this story, okay? And this is what to do and how to solve this problem. The main problem, as we said, is as you need to decrease, increase the number of particles and you need multiple imaging, you are hit by amount of data. You need to transfer very high speed video, if you want a lot of data, very high speed video to store the images and then to process them. So this here, it says imaging and it's simple, but this line now, if you do a high frame rate, becomes a very thick error. It's an error that today, uh, with the cameras, you are supposed to transfer, uh, uh, you're supposed to transfer um, um, about uh, uh, gigabyte per second, okay? It's uh, something like 2.6 gigabyte per second for, per camera. So, if you can do this analysis in real time, by hardware, you can solve a basic problem of 3D PTV, which means trackability. So, I want to increase the recording frame rate, but I cannot afford myself to record all this data and process later. So what I suggest you to do is to do the segmentation step in real time. So as the images arrive, I throw everything away and I keep only the position of the particle. So if I go from image, which is four megapixel, and I record it at 1,000 frames per second, I go down to the set of X pixel, Y pixel positions in time, and this, this set is four orders of magnitude smaller. This set you can record on a USB stick in real, line, in real time because even the recording time on the flash disk is uh, sufficient. So that what was developed and that what uh, Ron will show in a minute as a result, where the main concept was take high-speed cameras, use hardware, and uh, develop an algorithm that can convert uh, this density of bubbles, right, going, uh, flowing in this uh, tube uh, to real-time positions, and in the future we can do it in real-time tracking. So, uh, basically, the algorithm is not too difficult. It's, again, segmentation, the background from the object. 
The only thing we need to remember that I skipped this image, but this is a typical image. The typical image has reflections, which are not the object we want to track. They have all kinds of lines. They have all kinds of uneven illumination, so the reflections from the background, which are also not objects we want to try. And as our particles move across these objects, we want to keep track of them, so we don't want to lose them when their background is changing. So therefore, the simple imaging process and algorithm needs to take care also of the background, also of the modification of the image of the particle as it moves. And a little bit tricky, but it's again solved now if you do this kind of uh, uh, image processing. This image processing you can do now at 4 megapixels at 1,000 frames per second. And uh, you can do labeling. And only later, after you store this binary data, you can track it. And you will see soon what kind of, uh, what kind of uh, results you can get from RON. And you can go with this measurement to wind tunnel, environmental wind tunnel, which is 2 meter on 2 meter and 20 meters. And I will uh, stop here. If you have questions now on the basic stuff, I will answer. And I will also have time at the end after Ron's part to answer your questions, OK?